Choke is a 2008 American black comedy film written and directed by Clark Gregg, starring Sam Rockwell, Angelica Houston, Kelly McDonald, and Brad William Hankey. Excuse me, miss, that mole on your thigh? Yeah. You might want to get that looked at. Melanoma is the most common cancer for women, especially blondes. What's your name? Victor. I'm Terry Daiquiri. It's not my real name. Hey, you changed your hair. Yeah, because of what you said about blondes getting skin cancer. And welcome back to the Cult of Films. I'm John, the host, joined today by the illustrious Coleman and Mr. Mulligans. We are gathered here today to talk about a Chuck Palahniuk adaptation, not the one that most people have seen and have made basically insufferable to watch at this point. Uh, I used to tout Fight Club as probably my favorite film of all time, but the kind of like ultra dude bros have turned it on itself and now I can't even stomach to look at it. So instead we turn to surprisingly uh, the first feature from Agent Colson himself, Clark Gregg, that's 2008's Choke. So Coleman, why are we talking about Choke? Uh, well, Choke is the movie adaptation of the Chuck Palahniuk book, a great book. And of course, we're getting ahead of ourselves. We will be choking down some special guests. Uh, why don't we kick it off with Mr. Mulligan? Uh, I will be choking down some Corey Vecken from uh, Ardbeg out of Scotland. Ooh. Ooh, mm. yeah. Yes, this is my good stuff. Uh, Mr. Coleman, are you partaking tonight? I am partaking. I am drinking the Rubens Summer IPA, mm. a gift from a, a friend. Uh, it's light and crisp and fruity and delicious. Because I am drinking a bomber of Anderson Valley from Boonville, California, the salted caramel bourbon barrel aged porter, aged six months in bourbon barrels. This is a 9.5 percenter. So you all will you might have to do the show without me at some point. But I'm going to hang with you as long as I can. So to your health, gentlemen, Lahayim, let's choke down this episode. Cheers. Let's start at the beginning. Let's talk about Clark Gregg. How did Clark Gregg, of all people, get a hold of a Chuck Palnick adaptation? Well, because the studio that had the rights to this, which is, I think, Fox Searchlight, they... We're just kind of searching around for something. Clark Gregg expressed interest in stepping uh, out from in front of the camera to behind the camera. And it took him about four years to get the script right. But he got it so right, in my opinion, where even Chuck Palnick said that this was a closer adaptation to the book than... Fight Club was so someone that has read the book, which I have. It was it's been a while though, so I so I'm not gonna be as well versed with it. Uh, Coleman, you just kind of put down some pages. How close is the adaptation, and and how accurate is that comparison with uh, Fight Club? Um, so it's pretty close, and I liked in both adaptations that they used a lot of uh, the direct lines from the book. Uh, the dialogue was the exact same verbatim. There's definitely some details that were left out in both, some details that were changed a little bit more in Fight Club. Uh, this one stays truer to the original text, but just some of the scenes where they definitely went into more vivid detail uh, in the book than they did in the movie, which makes sense because some of this stuff just doesn't translate as well for film. Johnny, were you? I think you just watched this film for the first time last week. Did mm -hmm. you ever hear about this film? Was this on your radar at all? Or are you even a Chuck no. Palahniuk fan? <clears throat> I'm I am super rookie at movies, period. So if you're trying to make references to a director and the genre of films they've done, I'm not at that level. I don't I, you know, I wouldn't have made that connection. So I went into this very, very blind. I don't have the book as a reference. I just have what I see in front of me. And between the casting and the quality of the acting and the cinematography, the way they just portrayed things visually and told the story, it was it was a good watch. It, like it doesn't I really enjoyed watching this film and seeing how it all pieced together. And I think it was just executed in a very good way. And especially when you go and look up details like how much this movie cost to make, it's a three million dollar movie. 
holy hell, <laughs> that's a good $3 million movie. So it was, you know, it's a shame to see that it didn't, didn't go as well as it maybe could have in the, in the theaters. But then of course we also have to decide for ourselves, like, well, what was it up against? And maybe that's why it didn't make it so good on the opening weekend because it was dwarfed by something else. I'm very surprised with how poorly it did in the box office because I think there was definitely a cult following of moviegoers from Fight Club that were just chomping at the bit for another Chuck Palahniuk adaptation. And mm -hmm. by the time that this kind of rolled around, I, what, eight years, nine years later, it was like a ho-hum. It was a fart in the wind. No one cared. And that's crazy because of who was attached to this. Sam Rockwell and Angelica Houston, you think would demand a little bit more box office returns. Like you mentioned, Johnny, this was a $3.4 million budgeted film. It made a grand total worldwide, uh, or $3.9 million. So it, you gotta, it probably didn't have a huge marketing campaign behind it. So maybe it didn't, you know, lose a ton, but just breaking even in Hollywood at all is not where you want to be. So, I'm very surprised that this didn't at least have a bigger cult pop while it was in theaters because of how many people were waiting for this. It's not that surprising to me. So like you said, Fight Club was taken on by the dude bros as as a movie, right? Not as Polonik <laughs> fans. So Polonik is a very, I mean, if you haven't read him... <laughs> Very dark and disturbing writer, let's say. So there's definitely a smaller vein of people that are into the books. Um, so Fight Club gained the traction. I mean, you had Brad Pitt and Edward Norton. You had these major name draws. Sam Rockwell is an amazing actor. He's one of my favorite actors, but he's he's a low key guy. I mean, I was just talking about this with someone the other day. He's just one of those. He pops up in all kinds of different movies. Every once in a while, he's in something really big. But for the most part, he does these kind of smaller, maybe halfway independent movies and does them really well. And Angelica Houston has been in some big things, but I don't think alone she's a draw. So the fact that it wasn't bigger doesn't really surprise me. But I'm glad that it came out. I'm glad that it was made. And I'm glad that they used the cast that they did. I think what you said was 100% where Fight Club, you had Edward Norton as kind of the the narrator, the person that takes you through the journey, but it wasn't Edward Norton alone because Edward Norton is kind of runs in the same train tracks as a Sam Rockwell, right? But you also had Brad Pitt where all the girls want to fuck him and all the guys want to be him. And I think that's right. what made, you know, Brad why Fight Club popped so much because you had just so much appeal to it and, and everyone could, whether right or wrong, kind of make it a banner film about them where Sam Rockwell looks like us. <laughs> he's just like right. a, he's a dude. And there's even like one of the one of the cops or one of the people that are interrogating him in the movie, just like, Are you sure you've had sex with all these women? You? <laughs> like <laughs> Cause he right. has, he's such a good everyman. And and his and his friend is just like this big schlubby dude that we all have. Like I'm kind of a big schlubby dude, so it's like Angelica Houston's probably the most glamorous looking person in this film. Everyone's just so normal, but that's what is the allure about this. Because if you got if you get past those things of it not being flashy in a draw, it's so grounded and it's which is crazy because it's such a batshit film. So I'm gonna put this on Johnny Mulligan's. What is choke about? So Choke is about this – it's about the the lead character played by Sam Rockwell, I think, of Vincent Mancini. And it starts off with him – you know, we, we start seeing him going to the sexual addiction anonymous rehab kind of group therapy sessions. We see him visiting his mom in the mental hospital. It's sort of like – it's like this depressed – failed life it's funny the beginning is funny this is a, a comedy at first but as you get further as you go down that this rabbit hole you see a whole lot more depth and it seems like it's a movie shot in easter eggs 
it's sort of like you see bits and pieces of clues through visual cues in all of the scenes, but then you also get narrative as you go along and you start seeing these flashbacks and you get some backstory and everything kind of slowly expands out until you get this full picture at the end that started funny, but in the end is a little horrifying and depressing at the same time. And you start going from, oh, this is just a sexually addicted jerk to a, wow, this person are we spoiling can we spoil this oh yeah you, we'll say right here spoilers throughout you yeah. know you probably you might spoilers. not have seen choke because mm -hmm. you know it's you not probably a, haven't right you probably <laughs> have yeah. so we're just gonna give us a, like a final spoiler warning right now uh so mm -hmm. go watch the film and then come back and talk choke with us but definitely we want to talk about this film i mean we gave you 12 fucking years to go see it so <laughs> so here, there. Here, here's your disclaimer to see a full life picture of this person who is trying to figure out in the end who his real father is finds out that his mother isn't in fact his mother that he was in fact kidnapped and that's where we get a lot we get those pieces pulled together as we watch the flashbacks angelica houston is batshit crazy from the word go and we that comes out further more and more as we go further along and i think I, what was really cool about this is the way mm. they give you these snippets. They give you a piece of diet, like a piece of narrative in a flashback, and then they put a pin in that, and they move on to another piece, and you get another angle of what's going on in Sam's life, in Victor Mancini's life. And at the end, it's this kind of like bittersweet sort of you realize the trauma that this person has gone through, why they became the person that they were. And then in the very, very end, you find that these two mentally twisted, messed up people find each other in the very, very end. And it's sort of like that. It's that bittersweet moment. It's like, yay, they found each other. I didn't even realize I was waiting for that. But thank God it did happen. Oh. There's nuance and detail, and you're going to see a ton of actors that you'll be like, I know that person, and I saw them at this thing. <laughs> it's like... There, there. This was the beginning for a lot of people, and they all went off to do um, incredible things in either like Netflix series or movies. It's just like the people who got involved in this movie love must have loved the book. They must have loved working with Clark Gregg, and they must have known that this was going to be a passion project because they did a great job with their acting. And this wasn't like a big blockbuster movie. They knew a $3 million budget probably wasn't going to do that. I love it because it's so dark. And Johnny said it really well. It just, it starts kind of funny and it gets darker and darker and darker. And Angelica Ethan is batshit crazy throughout it. But even in the flashbacks and, and you see her craziness, it's all delivered with this like amount of screwed up love and like genuine care and you feel so bad for the kid and everything that he has to go through but she has this this interesting love for him and love how much depth they get into as you go on and, and it goes from being a comedy to just going wow that's really that's all really screwed up <laughs> But it takes you on that journey, and it's amazing. The fact that this was a first feature from someone is crazy. Because it's not like we're watching something visually groundbreaking, like a Denny Villeneuve film or, you know, like an Alex Garland film where it's just like eye-gasmic candy all the time. There's none of that. But the realness in the in which it's shot and the unraveling, it that's the beauty and the most fun thing about this film is how it unpackages itself because on face value where our pov character is this sick twisted person that could only get his kicks by pretending that he's choking in restaurants so to get sympathy or money from his would-be uh saviors or uh he just has to like have sex with absolutely everything that moves and if and if there's any kind of like emotional connection he gets bored and, and he can't do it but the more it unravels and the more the veneer wears off towards the end, you realize that everybody is fucked up around him. He's not this, like, you know, a fish out of water type person. No, he's, he's a fish walking amongst his own people. It's just that other people know how to hide it better because they have tools to do so because they're not... They're not. They didn't grow up with Angelica Houston kidnapping him in, in Iowa, right? And it's just like, just the fact that he was like, he's so crazy and he's like so 
just down for for whatever that he believes the the doctor lady this young doctor girl that like stem cell research research by fucking her in a church and then that he's like the the son of jesus because of a foreskin <laughs> sample is hilarious <laughs> is like literally the best thing ever and the best friend like he has his quirks like they're all and i i really like how this movie opens up kind of similar to Fight Club because we're both in like support groups, you know. It's like Bob, this is Bob. Bob has bitch tits, but it's like <laughs> instead of that, we're in a in a room with other sex addicts and stuff, and you all get their little proclivities. As the story progresses, you're just like, oh, these people aren't crazy. Even the most straight laced person who is played by the director, Clark Gregg, you know, Lord Farquaad or whatever. The, I know that's not his <laughs> name. Uh, L- L- Lord High Charlie is just like he can't. He can't ask a person out because he's like has to speak in like Ren Fair because he's just so bad at being a human. I, I just love how it's an indictment on literally everybody. It's just like different layers of how fucked up your your upbringing is is how much better you're able to hide it. Where it's just like you know by the end of it, people are just like, oh, we think you're great to the to to uh, Sam Rockwell's character. He's like, no, I, I literally am like. Poking like three stooges poking old ladies in the face and beating their walkers Smashing against lockers. Their walkers and shit. against lockers, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, because his crazy faux doctor girlfriend convinced everyone he was the second coming of Christ. First, like 15 minutes, he's having these flashes of seeing everybody naked, and then we have these little flashes of him getting, you know, having his sex addiction issues with literally everyone he encounters. So, everybody who worked at the mental home. He did something to tick them off because he went and got with them and never called them back. That's what I'm saying. Like Clark Gregg just killed it with the with the directing. It's just like we've all like looked at someone and then like automatically envisioned them naked. And the fact that they that he had the balls to go there and actually depict that, he has well, I, he has a lot of his of his extras in this film. <laughs> Well, he he was talk. He was he was probably staying. Now Colson can talk to talk to this more than me, but staying true to the book. If that's if this is a true adaptation of what the book was, then he was sticking to it. That was that was a good move on his part. Like if he's, and that wasn't even the part that like, I the story was portrayed so well that that part I didn't care about. It's like that was everything else was done so well. That was just like a. Oh, there's a naked person. Okay, <laughs> moving on. What's next on the plot? It's like it was done really well. Even like the that nun that runs the the, the hospital. <laughs> Even better, like the premise of the movie. The title of this movie was, you know, choke. The whole point of what is choke about? Well, this guy pretends he's choking in restaurants so he can get money from them. We see that three or four times. My favorite one when he's trying to get, you know. A blind person to save his life. Or <laughs> <laughs> he's like, oh, swatch? No. This? Yeah. <laughs> he's well, like, I was... looks to the side. I'm like, I saw, I saw the look on the guy's face. I'm watching. I was like, <laughs> he's not reacting. He's blind, isn't he? Then we see the stick. I'm like, ha 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 ha. And then the sushi chef is gone. <laughs> he's gonna save himself. <laughs> That was that was one of probably one of my favorite scenes. But the whole premise of like the title of the movie is is just like. It's a backdrop. It's not even yeah. a. It's not even a centerpiece of the movie. It's a layer, and yeah, that's, that's it's a layer. It. But it, it, it's not. It's not the most important one. Like no, yeah, it, it's it's a glimpse into how fucked up the whole picture is, and the choke is just this small piece of it that he learned from his messed up childhood. And I, I love that fact as well. That it's that it's such a small piece of the movie, an ongoing theme. But it's a very small part of the theme. And then as far as the book to movie adaptation goes, so there is some stuff with the nurses where like when Sam Rockwell is talking to Dr. Paige Marshall, they just linger a little longer in the book on the nurses kind of snickering or waiting or their reactions because they know right. who Dr. Paige Marshall is and they're watching him. And they don't really, I feel like, express that as much in the movie. Sure. Um, yeah. You know, really show the nurses knowing who Paige is. I rewatched it to check to try to see if I could get get glimpses of that, and there's a little bit, but not too much. 
Only a little bit. The be- I think the best example might be the one scene where he's in a conversation with Do- Dr. Paige Marshall, and she s- explains to him, I can't see you outside of here. And then it's like one you one nurse off in the distance calls her to a room. And, and that's really it. And you really don't put that together right. until the very end when she's trying to save Angelica Houston's character and you see the, the, the bracelet on her arm and he realizes you're a patient. Like it all just comes crashing together in that moment. You realize, Oh my God, all the nurses really were in on this, even though they didn't put those details in like they did in the book. I think that that still was done well. A nuanced twist how they handled it because like they, they kind of set it up with him imagining people without their clothes on because he can't walk through that hospital without looking at a nurse and then we get a flashback to the scene where they're having sex with each other so you're just like oh the nurses are so hawkish because they don't want another one of their own falling victim to this the scumbag but little did we know it was a joke on him the entire time. But it was also a joke on the nurses, too, because, like, everyone fucked them. So <laughs> it was just there was just so many layers. And like you said, the the choke aspect just by itself was, yeah. It, it, and that might be a reason. I, I could see why this was a reason why people adored this film and people detested this film in equal levels because it had so much going on. This is what I call a pure spaghetti against the wall movie. Like, they literally chucked... Uh, Chuck pollinated a bunch of spaghetti against the wall and whatever stuck, you know, stuck. And that's how Chuck Palahniuk kind of writes. Like, if you've ever, you think, uh, you know, Choke or Fight Club are weird, like, read Pygmy or Invisible Monsters. Like, oh, yeah. He gets, re- he could get real weird where it's almost like, what? Like, it's, it's like Fuge State, like, but like deeper than like a David Lynch style. So, fact that. There is so many layers to this because on the surface, it's kind of a romantic comedy, right? It just has some real gross out humor and it has some real heart to it. I, and I'll confess this, I get teary eyed and I did again today watching the, uh, on the rewatch, everything is revealed and she's talking to him in the uh, waiting room where she's like, I can't go through the door, you know, obviously because she's a patient and like her just spilling out everything and, and his reaction, like Sam Rockwell fucking just murders this role because he does everything from just being a complete dirt bag to being hilarious to falling asleep during a hand job scene to crying. Being, and, being and, Jesus for all the old being ladies. Jesus, yeah. And him like <laughs> running, you know, like putting his hands up above and telling you going, live, live. Like he just buys him. So half assed. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Come He's on, live. Man. It's like if live. any one of us was suddenly, you know, then we found out we were the next Jesus. We'd be like, what, what the fuck do we do with that? You know? So it, I think that was the downfall and what made this this film great for the people that got it. Because the people that got it fucking love this film. And I think us three uh, are in that group. But the people that didn't like it, just average moviegoers. They showed up and they're just like, "What is this? Is this a is this a Judd Apatow film?" In 2008, a lot of this kind of things already came out, so you already had this kind of like preconceived notion of what this movie should have been. Even if you knew nothing about it, you just took a whim on it. You're sitting down, you're like, "Oh, this is just a gross out, blah blah blah," and then it shows enough heart, or then it goes to a different level. You know, you're, they're pulling anal beads out, and one gets stuck, and they're like, "Oh my god! Like, what do I do with this film?" <laughs> <laughs> that, that joke comes up later on in the fact in right detectives. <laughs> Jesus. Again, ballsy move from a first time director to actually go for it though. It's just like his directing gigs here. And he's got he's working with Agents of Shield. I don't know I, I don't know how often did that how many seasons did that have? Was it just two? No, nah, it went on for a while. It did? Okay. Because it looks like he was involved in directing with that as well. Oh, it's still I, going on. Sorry. Yeah. It's, I only, I hadn't, I think I got through the first two seasons. I did. But I think, you know, the people he's been associated with, the people he's worked with, he's worked with Marvel Studios, he's worked with um, John Favreau with the Marvel movies. I, I think I think that plays a role in, in Greg Clark's ability to get behind the camera as well. Because he's been working with, he's done so many big action movies and, and has worked with 
bigger names in the industry, he's had some mentoring going on there. And that's I feel like that's got to play a role in why this movie did so did as well as it did. In my personal opinion, as far as performance, not necessarily at the box office, because like you said, Fight Club was picked up by the dude bros, which definitely aren't going to be into something like this. So that's why it wouldn't translate to that crowd. Or and, would uh, be into this, ironically. They're really, like, <laughs> you see him fucking that one chick, and, uh, and then he feels like you're in a hand job. I've been there in Vegas, bro. Yeah. yeah I could... It's really liked, really liked by guys that row boats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can see that. Well, and, and another thing is he cut his teeth as far as, you know, not doing just the acting on. He wrote What Lies Beneath. So that was directed by Robert Zemeckis, uh, Harrison Ford, Michelle Pfeiffer vehicle. So that was another reason why Chuck Palahniuk felt so comfortable with his material because of, of what he could do with those actors and that story and how much money that made. Uh, so he he had it in him to be this kind of, you know. You, you see Agent Coulson, and he always has that just, you know, placid, shitting grin on his face, and it's just like, but that that's the character, but that's like, he's a really, like, just down dude, and it, it's great. I'm a big fan of Sam Rockwell here. Confessions Cut. of a Dangerous Mind? It's a great movie. I don't think I've seen Dangerous Mind. That was, see, that's that's what I feel like, Sam Rockwell could kind of disappear into a lot of different roles, and that, if you like... Just weird, unhinged Sam Rockwell that disappears into his roles. I think this is one of them. I think Confession of the Dangerous Mind is another one. But then he could also do your, you know, your major Justin Hammer roles in Iron Man 2 or whatever. He started a movie with Anna Kendrick. They're like, they both end up being these killer assassins by just default because they can, like, they know how to feel the essence of the blade or something. Mr. Wright. It's Mr. Wright. The, uh, he plays the role of a hitman who grows a conscious, and every time someone hires him for a hit, he kills them. <laughs> hey, that film had RZA in it, so if you stand out against the RZA, then you're doing something yeah, right. That one, that one was a, that was another one. Like I loved that movie. That was a fantastic movie, too. So I think Rockwell, if you see Sam Rockwell, go watch that movie, because <laughs> the dude oh, does yeah. good work. He, he was does. great in Jojo Rabbit. Yeah. He Which does, was an amazing movie in its he own does right. Everything but. so great, and he just looks so normal, and that's why maybe that's right. part of it too. Yeah, he's the kind of schmuck you can relate to. It's like I could be that guy. Yeah, I feel like it doesn't have a real cult following, which is kind of one of the precursors to be featured on this show. But it's one of those that I think should. Like, I featured a film not too long ago in Black Mountainside where. It was just like the best horror movie that zero people saw, and that's tragic. And I feel like Choke is kind of in that same vein, but even more tragic because you have like real actors and real people that were involved with this. It's written flawlessly. It's hilarious. It's just batshit crazy. It's at, it's on par as far as like the the writing goes and the script goes with Fight Club. Like it's that you know, witty and sharp and everything. So the fact that I don't think that this gets enough love is tragic. And that's why I'm glad that we're featuring this film. Yeah. And I, you know what I think there's no, the other thing that happens here is you're going to find if any, if you're a fan of the community of the, the show community, the whole college, the comedy college scene thing, you can go back and to this movie and find what the lead, uh, Oh God, I'm blanking on her name. I should know. Cherry Daggery. Jillian Jacobs. So if you're a Jillian Jacobs fan, you go back and watch Choke. If you're an Angelica Houston fan, you go and watch Choke. Like, there are a bunch of actors that showed up in this film that went off, either had already done bigger things or went off to do bigger things. It This really, that's the cool part about this movie. It won't be one of those cult films that, like, gets recognition because it became a cult film. It becomes a cult film because it's going to be all these other fan bases coming in and be like, well, let's figure out who they, what else did they do? What's choke? And they go and find choke. And it's like, oh, it's going to be a slow burn. I think that's right. what's going to happen. People that discover it. Like you see that it leaves behind is a good adaptation, a really good, well, well written, well acted movie. I think it's a very story driven movie for as messed up as it is. I mean, we were talking earlier about the people that just wouldn't, get it 
if you like story driven movies and you can kind of follow the storyline of what what the movie is really about, I think those people will really appreciate it. Unless you're the Fight Club fan who just wanted to see people punching each other in the face, ah, this was not for you. But if you're looking for depth and nuance and an interesting delivery of a story, this this does it, man. Just get there. See, I it's think it, good. I think it has that duality, uh, like we discussed, Coleman, when we talked about Idiocracy, where if you are just one of those fans that want to see boobs and for and like you know dick jokes and stuff, then this is your film. If you want to put a little bit more time and effort into your quote unquote gross comedy, then this is your film also because it is written it is an adaptation of a Chuck Palnick book. So it has that pedigree for the sharps, but it also has that face level enjoyment for the farts. So <laughs> Coleman, who would you recommend this film for? I think you're right in that the sad part is is the people that just watch it for the, you know, the boobs and the dick jokes uh, will be missing so much. Yeah. But I um, I'd recommend it to people who really like a good story in their film and i'd really recommend it to people with really fucked up families uh because they could i think there's a lot of people that could watch this and identify with parts of it and you know maybe not to the extent of how messed up this family was but i think that there's a lot of people that could identify with various parts of this movie uh and, and see themselves and see their own relationships in it damn definitely a therapeutic movie for those types of people i know I had a crazy relationship with my mother, and maybe that's why it connected with me on a different <laughs> level, because I was putting myself into young Sam Rockwell place in, in this film, and it was like, uh, oh, I don't want to I don't want to cut him short. Jonah Boo Boo, a wonderful actor, and, and he did good work in this film, so it, it brings out a lot, right? Like, it, it has so much nuance to it that it is so many different things for so many different people. And I could still appreciate how funny it was, but I could also appreciate the underlying things that it doesn't say, but it shows you or that it includes. And man, it like hits you like a freight truck. You, you, you don't think a, a, a film like this where it centers around a, a sex addict and, and the best friend that just jacks off at, at any sign of a female <laughs> has like emotional depth to it, but goddamn does it. And it nails it and it knocks it out of the park. People need to see this film. More people need to see this film. It's not the most accessible film. It's not streaming anywhere for free. You, I, I had to rent it again, Amazon Prime. But mm -hmm. it's worth the four bucks. Like seriously, it, you know. And, and like you said, Johnny, it's it's kind of a good date night movie too. It's it's got enough of that to be accessible. And that's who you know. This is kind of bleeding into who I recommend it for. I'd recommend it for a date night. I'd recommend it to. To people that just want to laugh, and I recommend it to people that are big Chuck Palahniuk uh, fans because this is a very, very astute adaptation of a book. And goddamn, adapting any type of you know film to page or page to film is super tough. It's, it's million people have tried to do that with Stephen King and failed. Like Frank Darabont gets a pass; he does pretty well, but Clark Gregg really understood the source material and it showed that it took him four years to actually s turn a camera on to refine the script and i'm glad that he took the time to do that and i'm glad that those two kind of found each other as kindred spirits to to make a great film that no one saw and, and that's terrible because it's like they went through all this trouble and no one fucking cared but guess what i did and these two guys did and thank you for watching this episode of the cult of films let's go around the horn mr coleman yeti where can everyone find you tell everyone what you're up to uh you can find me at coleman yeti uh on twitter um you can check me out making cameos um on youtube at Two Bananas, Adventure, and Gear. Ooh. Yeah. And then also check out uh, some friends of mine have a podcast that I guest on occasionally called Is God the Devil? Perfect. <laughs> and, and here occasionally, right? And here as well. And here as well. Mr. Johnny the Mulligans. Look into that camera and tell everyone what you're up to. You can find me somewhere on Twitter. 
at the Johnny Mulligans. Not nah, at Johnny Mulligans. And then uh, <laughs> now you just confuse people. <laughs> you could just find me. I- I'm skulking around here. You- you'll find me in Cult of Films. That's where you'll find me. Perfect. And you can find me right here uh, at John the Host. Uh, subscribe to this or on Twitter. You can subscribe to this very YouTube channel. They said we said. Uh, and uh, so you could not miss a beat and watch all these shows coming out and the other show that I host with Jason Alt Film Hooligans. Check those out. You could follow us, uh, this show specifically on Twitter at the cold of films all under case very easy to find until next time do we have a cool choke outro anybody bueller <laughs> bueller <laughs> <laughs> choking all right we'll see you next time <laughs>